project, I have to say. Every time I've come up to one of these meetings over the last three years or so, uh, I have just been bowled over by, uh, oh, you just wait, folks, you just wait. Believe me, this is going to make Shakespeare great again. <laughs> uh, it, uh, the illumination that comes from the examples I've seen, I, I mean, this morning I learned another one. Uh, you'll have to wait. Uh, to hear all about it, and I thought, I never knew that before. People say sometimes, uh, we know everything about Shakespeare, he's been uh, studied for, for 300 years or more, after all, nothing new to be learned about Shakespeare. This is just so not true when it comes to the study of his language, and other things too, perhaps, but from the language point of view, you only have to spend five minutes doing the sort of thing that Jonathan and his team have been doing and you say, I never knew that. Did anybody know this? This is really illuminating. And that's what's going to come out of this project. And you'll hear examples of this later on this afternoon. You know, these are tasters, teasers, if you like, of the sort of thing that the project will generate in due course, ubiquitously. Uh, for my part, uh, as Jonathan has just said, my, my recent work in, in Shakespeare has been almost predominantly in an area that this particular project has not been uh, focusing upon, and that is, as he said, original pronunciation. Um, and I thought it might be worthwhile just bringing you up to speed on what's been happening in that domain, because uh, there are some interesting points of overlap between that kind of project and the one that you're hearing about today. Original pronunciation, or original pron too many syllables, OP. <laughs> OP for short, that's what we all call it, those of us in that business, OP. It's become a bit of a movement. Um, although in the mid-19th century there was interest in exploring Shakespearean pronunciation by the uh, philologists of the time, and Daniel Jones was very interested in this back in the early decades of the last century, uh, it didn't really start being explored in a dramatic way, that is in a theatre context, until the 1950s, where one or two people dipped their toe into the water. Um, in Cambridge, for example, the Marlowe Society did a production of Julius Caesar in original pronunciation, and in America there was another one. But this lacked the, the perspective that historical phonology can provide, because in the 1950s, that was a subject that was in its very earliest stages of development. So nothing really happened for 50 years, until 2004, when Shakespeare's Globe in London devoted to original practices, as you know, original theatre as best they could devise it, uh, original music on original instruments, original clothing, but not original speech. And the reason was that they felt that uh, pronunciation of 400 years ago would be unintelligible to a modern audience. The Globe uh, has no public subsidy. So they have to fill the theatre every time, and they thought if we put something on in OP, um, nobody will understand it, so nobody will come, and it'll be a disaster. So when I was telephoned by uh, director Tim Carroll for a production of Romeo and Juliet in OP in 2004, first question I asked him was, um, how did you manage to persuade the trustees to do this project? And he said, it was very easy, David, very easy. I simply said to them, if we don't do it first, Stratford will. <laughs> and of course, you know the, uh, the competitive nature that there is between the theatres in this country, yes. So Glo the Globe did it, yes. They put on but just a weekend of OP in the middle of June because they were still a bit uncertain about the whole project. But it was hugely successful. It was very intelligible. There was no particular difficulty about it at all. Is there, really? Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention. A kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. Then should the war, like Harry Lake himself, assume the port of Mars and their zeals, laced in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment. To households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona, where we lay our sin. From ancient grudge, bred to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal lines of these two foes of her star cross lovers take their life, whose misadventure piteous overthrows doth with their death bury their parents' strife, and so on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was taught Shakespeare from the age of about two. <laughs> no, but you know, intelligible, of course it is. 
And anybody who hears this who's a native speaker of English immediately recognizes some of the echoes of that accent in the parts of the world where they come from. That's what people say. We used to speak like this where I come from. And what you hear in that accent is, of course, the R pronounced after the vowel, which for this country will remind people of the West Country. But in America, of course, it's a very common phenomenon. You'll hear a O for the muse of fire. O, not O, for a muse of fire. O, where do you get that? You get that in Wales, you get it in various other places. Kingdom for a stage. Where do you hear stage? Aye, right, in Yorkshire, you hear stage, don't you? Uh, that's the pronunciation of it there. And you can go round the, the features of that accent and say, hey, you hear that in Australia, you hear that in Canada, and so on. So the thing about OP is that it reaches out to people in a way that RP uh, does not. <laughs> one, one of the things that I did uh, when the Globe was doing its production, I used to go around the yard in the Globe and ask people how they were finding it. And there were a group of inner city lads over in the corner, and I went to them, from, they were from East London, and I said, how are you finding it, lads? And they said, oh, it's great, isn't it? Uh, and I said, you know, why? And one lad said to me, because he says, yeah, we got a theatre sometime, they all speak posh. But this lot, they're speaking like us. <laughs> well, as you've heard, it's not a Cockney accent. But because the accent was not, in inverted commas, posh, they felt that it was speaking to them. And that's the key, that the, the OP is a kind of warming accent, uh, an accent that reaches out in a way that RP does not. And this is why our OP has become a bit of a movement. Because since 2004, the Globe did it again in 2005 with Troilus and Cressida, a full run this time. In the audience at that time were people from all over the Shakespearean world who had heard about this experiment. And they took it back with them. And in particular, the Americans took it back. Why? Because OP sounds more like American English than RP does. <laughs> And in America, I've spoken to dozens of actors and directors over the last 20 years, and they all say the same thing. We never felt we could own Shakespeare because we can't do the accent, you see. It's all Olivier and Gilgood, and if we try to do it, it sounds phony. Uh, whereas now, OP, well, yes, we feel we can own that, and that's what's happened. In America, uh, there have been a dozen companies that have done plays in OP, uh, one company in um, Baltimore, the Shakespeare Factory, the Baltimore Shakespeare Factory does an OP production every year. And altogether at the moment, as far as I know, about uh, 15 or so of the plays have been done in OP. And what happens is that as you do a play in OP, you discover all sorts of interesting things. Uh, rhymes that don't work in modern English suddenly work. Uh, puns that aren't clear in modern English suddenly make sense an overall new phonesthetic of the lines it emerges. And all kinds of character features turn up, like for instance in Midsummer Night's Dream, when that was done at the University of Kansas in 2010, a great deal of the discussion in the rehearsal room was what to do with the H's that are dropped routinely uh, to households, both alike in dignity, not households. Right, well, what do we do then? And they discussed this at length, obviously both pronunciations were possible at the time. Uh, they decided that the, um, uh, that, that the, uh, the nobles, uh, the, the nobility, uh, would pronounce their H's because they knew how to read, so that was very fine. Uh, the mechanicals would drop their H's because they were mechanicals, and while they did know how to read, they probably wouldn't have pronounced them in everyday speech. Big question which took up all the time was, what do we do with the fairies? Are they upper class fairies and pronounce their H's? Or are they lower class fairies and they do not pronounce their H's? You couldn't believe the discussion that there was on this before they decided that they were lower class fairies um, and they all dropped their H's. Which immediately, of course, gave Puck an option when he's tracing the lovers through the forest and, and putting on the voice of Demetrius and Lysander and he could put the H's back in again. And so there was a lovely uh, dramatic point which probably nobody noticed apart from the actors, the director, and any historical phonologists that might have been <laughs> in the audience. Now, the interesting thing is that OP has gone beyond the theater. And this is why I think there's some relevance for Jonathan's project. 
because the constituencies that have become interested in OP are much greater than the theatre constituency. In particular, in the original Globe performances, uh, in the audience were quite a large number of people from the early music societies of the world. And early music is just as interested in OP and then, by larger argument, the sort of thing that Jonathan and everybody is doing here, as is the theatre world. Uh, after all, if you're singing uh, Dowland or Bird or even as late as Purcell or whatever, the rhymes don't work there either and there is a fascination with producing these songs in OP. A second constituency is the uh, heritage industry. There are, as you know, in various parts of the world, people who are trying to reconstruct, for tourist reasons as much as anything else, how things were. Go to Stratford, you see people wandering around the streets dressed in Elizabethan costumes and saying things like, it's wicked, in it. <laughs> and so, well, sorry, no, can we just turn that into original practice? Well, yes, they then put on some forsooths and verilies, but they pronounce them in modern English, and it just doesn't work so well. So they're interested in OP as well as um, extrapolating from the kind of uh, Elizabethan English that Jonathan and others are doing. And the third constituency which surprised me was in 2011, uh, which was the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible, and it suddenly turned out that there are an awful lot of Bible people out there uh, who are interested not just in uh, how the Bible uh, is to be pronounced, which was the issue that involved me in OP, uh, but also the whole question of how it slots into the background of early modern English. And it is the early modern English more general perspective, which of course is one of the fundamental perspectives of this particular project. And so what I found is that although my world of original pronunciation seemed at first to be light years away from the kind of thing that Jonathan and his team were doing, actually, as I found the way in which people were implementing it, I suddenly discovered that they were actually relating it to matters of grammar and sentence length and sentence balance and emphasis and stress and in the metrical line and things like that and lexicon um, in a way that uh, really did to begin with surprise me but now I think is absolutely routine. So I know that Jonathan's got nothing better to do next year than uh, um, once his project is over than sleep um, <laughs> but actually in due course I would hope to see some sort of rapprochement between the kind of phonological world that I've been involved with and the kind of lexical and grammatical world that they have been involved with. So that's uh, my perspective for this afternoon. I'm very much looking forward to hearing uh, some of the findings that have taken place because you're going to be thrilled by them. I know you are. Thank you. Generally, I should say, um, for reasons